It's common knowledge in Hollywood that for every studio film that gets made, there are hundreds of others that never get to see the green light of day. But what people may not think about is this, that for every studio film that gets made, there are hundreds of other films that do also get made, but that fly well beneath the general public's awareness radar. These are the independents. Underneath the blazing billboards of the big guys, teeming there like microscopic bedbugs in a Sealy Sutter mattress, they're down there, working in the back rooms, the alleys, the trusted woods, making their little films with little fanfare, but with a whole lot of chutzpah and a whole lot of heart. Some both with chutzpah and heart. Filmmakers like Damon Packard, a man without connections, without an agent or a three-picture deal, or even a script for that matter, but making his film nonetheless like thousands of others. This is his story. It was a warm winter afternoon in Los Angeles, and I just met writer-director Damon Packard. Damon was shooting a film that he had described to me as a weird horror thriller called Night Gallery Revisited, Reflections of Evil. He had hinted that today's scene would be pretty special. He said he was staging a big martial arts battle in the heart of Chinatown, and this I could not miss. In the roles of the assailants were two men, one named Mitsuyoki, who obviously had martial arts chops, and another Asian guy who I think Damon hired because, well, he was another Asian guy. I asked Damon if he could tell me what the scene was all about. We're shooting some scenes with Asian screaming. With Asian screaming? Uh-huh. And uh, we're going to do two, two, two different scenes all together. You know, actually, we should do the laundry scene first. And that's about where I lost Damon. But luckily his friend Chad chimed in and kind of filled me in on what was about to take place. His character, Bob, is coming out of the laundromat. And he's, he has all these overshirts he wears all the time. In this case, he's coming out without his overshirts, without his protection. And of course he gets jumped because he's emanating this field of hostility and negativity wherever he goes and random acts of chaotic violence occur. I'm going to be like using my shirts to to guard against the ninja. Mm -hmm. Let's try to go slow. Okay, here I come. My shirts. You gotta, you, gotta, you gotta enter the shot swinging the ninja. You're already swinging the ninja when you enter the shot. Action! Ah! Okay, well, it wasn't exactly what I expected, but what really bugged me the most was that I just couldn't figure out what this all meant. It was a puzzle to me, and I puzzled some more, and, and then ultimately decided not to worry about it. Forget it, I thought. It's Chinatown. At this point, I thought I had Damon's film pretty well pegged ultra low budget, no pay, where the director also acts as lead cameraman and lead actor. So you can imagine my surprise that the next time I visited Damon's film, things were entirely different. He had rented this huge house and had even hired a lighting director who had two assistants working under him, as well as a stable of PAs helping out. There was even a grip truck with tons of lighting gear. Now this all surprised me, but as I'd soon learned, nothing about Damon or his film could be confined within ordinary expectations. Eddie, what's your role in the film today? Um, electric, I guess. Electric? And Will, you're just helping out here? Yeah. And what do you do normally? I'm a writer. Oh really? You like write screenplays or novels? Yeah, or what screenplays, do you... screenplays. Mostly science fiction or uh, either politics or science fiction. I just uh, submitted to the agents the letters, the inquiry letters and all that. And, uh, so what script did you submit? Was it a political thing or was it science? I submitted uh, science... a script about, uh, about a big war between the Colombian Mafia and the Italian Mafia for the New York Territory. Wow. So did you have to do a lot of research for that or did you know? No, uh... actually I lived in Colombia so I know how the Mafia operates. And then there's enough Italian Mafia movies around here to, to get to know the stuff. You know? 
Will, who had grown up in Colombia, wasn't the only crew member that day who had come from outside America. There was also a girl from the Czech Republic who was working as a PA for the very first time. My name is Lenka and I am AP over here. And how did you get this job? Through the phone. I'm making a mess. Yes, ma'am. Complete mess. But that's the point, right? Right, I guess. The reason he's living in this little sunken area is because you kicked him out of his room. Oh, oh he lives there. Yeah. Oh, okay, I like room. that. I like that. Yeah, he's going to come down here. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> I think he'd get a kick out of that one. Oh. They're all alone. You live in a nest of sweetened cereal. As the evening wore on and I continued to talk with Will, he revealed how he had a desire to be an actor, and in fact that he excelled in a particular style of acting. Through the years, I have specialized in acting, you know, pretty much when, they, when the actor needs to be raving mad about something because of some reason. I've been able to be pretty good at that, you know, because uh, just I, people say that sometimes they see a transformation in me when I'm, when I'm normal and then all of a sudden I get mad. Well, let's try a scene. Let's say you have a cookie in your hand. A what? No, you have a cookie in your hand. And I, cookie? Yeah, I say, I take your cookie. Give me that. What's you don't that? have it anymore. You don't have that cookie. What the hell's wrong with you, man? Every time I get a, a fucking cookie, you always take it like you think the thing is yours. And then all of a sudden, I'm the bad guy. Then every time you go and tell your friends that I'm a jerk because I'm telling you to give me back my cookie, what the fuck's wrong with you, man? It's like, sometimes I just don't see it. I'm, I'm the victim here. But somehow your friends, you're so cool, you know, just stuck Screw away that, you know, so fuck you, man. Give me my fucking cookie. I'm gonna kick your fucking ass. Even if it's not worth it, I'll do it. Well, you take it back. I... Fucking A, man. I'm not dealing with... <laughs> I don't know. I'm not gonna deal with you. Yeah, I can see it down beneath that calm exterior. You've got something bubbling underneath there, I think. Oh, thanks. Thanks. <laughs> Listening to Will reminded me of something that I've discovered while working around films, which is this. I've yet to come across a film whose story is more interesting than some of the people who work on it. Case 1, Will, the aspiring writer-actor who spent most of his time flirting with Lanka, who seemed to be enjoying it. Case 2, Alan. Now, Alan was apparently a friend of somebody's who had showed up to do I don't know what. He apparently had worked for a company that had made detailed replicas of sci-fi models and props. This thing, okay, when we sold these, they were $350, right? Mm -hmm. You'd have these guys go, oh man, I don't know, 350 bucks, that's a lot of money, you know, I gotta find my hookers tonight, you know, I gotta need money for the bus, right? 1500 on eBay now. And they come up to you and they go, you know, I could have bought that for 400 bucks, but it's like, you snooze or lose, I got one. I'm trying to figure out a way, because I couldn't find one of those Astro Pops, those pointy things, could not find one anywhere. We need one tomorrow for shooting. So what I'm thinking is, why don't you if it's, figure out some way of chiseling this so you've got like a point. So it looks like some horribly dangerous 70s candy. It might even be funnier than one of those Astro Pops. Just chisel this so you've got like a, like a knife. Or okay. Christmas tree point. That's what I was trying to do here. See, I got it like on one side, kind of like the shape. Mm -hmm. But then I went to the other side and it broke. Well, it's like it weakens the integrity of the yeah. sucker or something. I don't know. Well, here's another one. Try again. Well, the evening wore on and preparations were made for Beverly's scenes. But still, there sat Alan in the kitchen, regaling everyone with stories, like his days dressing up as costumed characters at sci-fi conventions. Back in the old days, those costumes, man, there was just something about it. Chicks would just come up to you and like, I've always wanted to have sex with Darth Vader. And you know, you kind of, what are you going to say, no? So like a Chewbacca costume and like a Boba Fett would have the um, same appeal? Mm, no, Chewbacca, they think you're like a big fuzzy, uh, thing like and they just want, yeah, they, they, you're like a stuffed animal. They just want to like hold you and cuddle you and stuff. Um, Boba Fett is more of a guy's costume. Guy, the guys think Boba Fett's cool, 
but I'm not into that. And um, so Darth really, Maul. Darth Maul is very popular yeah. with the ladies because he's got that whole devil thing with the, the horns and the yellow eyes and stuff. And it's like they're horrified, yet they cannot look away. All right, let's do the whole walkthrough thing here so I can get all the, the windows and everything moving. It was really getting late now and my curiosity was getting the best of me. I finally asked Alan what his role was here. I'm the, uh, the yeti creature in the window. I didn't know there was a yeti creature. Oh yeah. Yeah, we pulled out all the stops in this epic. Apparently the yeti creature doesn't really do anything to anybody. He's just like... Outside. You're really a yeti creature in this? Yeah. And you've got a Yeti costume? Well, it's actually a Chewbacca costume, but, you know, we're taking artistic license. All right. Let's make magic. Let's just try and run through it. Ready and action, sound spot. Oh. What's, what does that mean, the guy over there? He's, he's a, doing, or what is this part of the... He's a Yeti. Yeti, okay. It's like Bigfoot. But how come... From where he comes, or why he's over there? Why is there a Bigfoot outside the window? Yeah. Well, that's that's the thriller. That's what makes it interesting. Eventually, he'll come up inside. Yeah, move in and out of the shot. Does he come inside? Otherwise, there wouldn't be no movie. <laughs> is Bigfoot gonna kill the lady? No. <laughs> uh, the lady might kill Bigfoot. Uh, straight yeah. to straight to video. Exactly. <laughs> And so on it went, more Bigfoot, more yelling, and even some scenes with a girl in bed hearing voices. And again, I found myself asking just how this all tied together. So I was glad when I finally had the opportunity to sit down with Damon and ask him just that. I asked him if he could finally just summarize his story for me. The movie is about this character, Bob, who's a... The next time I met up with Damon, he was heading into Universal Studios Hollywood. His plan was to shoot some 1970s flashback scenes on the studio tour tram, actors and all. Now, I thought this was a pretty brazen move, but by now I'd learned that Damon had very little interest in convention. And I learned he applied his Maverick style not only to making films, but marketing them as well. When I first finished this film called Apple, I sent a tape to Francis Coppola from Dennis Hopper with Dennis Hopper's home address. Made it look very legitimate and everything. He, Coppola looked at the tape. He watched it. Now, I was sure there was going to be some sort of scene here. I couldn't imagine that the Universal people were just going to let a rogue filmmaker shoot on the property without any permission. But, in truth, no one really cared. The Universal people, I realized, were probably very used to people with cameras in their hands. I had admired Damon's devil make here attitude. As I watched him, it reminded me of another young filmmaker who had snuck onto the Universal lot to follow his filmmaking dreams. A young kid from Arizona named Steven Spielberg. Yes, Steven Spielberg. Yes, yes. Steven, Steven Spielberg. Spielberg. So, was I surprised to see a young Steven Spielberg the next time I showed up on Damon's shoot? No, not really. At this point, I'd realized that Damon's film was like a Zen riddle. The more you tried to understand it with rational thought, the more its true meaning eluded you. I'd learned just to sit back and enjoy the experience, and this was quite an experience. Today's scene involved a film shoot that takes place in the 70s, directed by a young Steven Spielberg that goes horribly wrong. Apparently a dummy gets dropped on some sensitive equipment, causing the whole set to explode and electrocute some of the crew. Damon had rented a studio for the lighting equipment and had even hired a pyrotechnics expert to oversee the explosions. 
Playing the fake crew was a motley collection of crusty actors who apparently usually hired themselves out as a group. They called themselves the Pac-10. There's no coffee, well, that's coffee. no perks. This is not even no budget. This is <laughs> underground budget. This is like 1960s low budget independent B action adventure sci-fi horror films that I used to do when I was 20. You used to do them? Been a filmmaker since. It was on Sunset yeah. Boulevard, at the, next to the Whiskey A Go Go, eating Hamburger Hamlet, and yes, and this walk. actor named John Cassavetes, who was a star in those days, came up to me and said, "You look like me. I'm making a movie at the Whiskey. I'm going to shoot it. You're going to double me." I never left show business since then. When when uh, uh, the Dan Dan here drops, okay, I'm going to say now. That's that's me panning. I'm going on now, and that's your cue. Just set it off. All right. Once I start the sequence. It's going right on through. Bam, 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 right on. So, just remember what we said. That's that's me panning. Directing everyone. If people were getting hurt, and I was just told them to keep rolling, just keep going. Do you think that's how the real Spielberg probably is, yeah, or what? He's very animated. Like that, you know. Has anyone ever told you you look like a young Steven Spielberg, or? No. That's that's me panning. How did you get involved in, in this production? Uh, I'm asking myself that. Yeah, how did I get involved in this? I've done everything from the shooters to uh, Logan's Run to Close Encounters to uh, the Abyss. Do you do a lot of small? Because this is really about. I'm doing a documentary about this small about filmmakers. The what was you gonna say? <laughs> I've actually seen worse. You know, I worked with uh, with Charles Band and Trauma Productions and uh, Full Moon and you name all the slime balls in Hollywood. You know? But these are some nice guys. He's a nice guy. Oh, he may be another Spielberg. Who knows? Huh. Another Steven Spielberg. Well, that was high praise. I asked Damon if, like Steven Spielberg, he had a desire to work on big studio productions. I, I don't think I'd work well in a studio environment. I've had, you know, a handful of meetings with producers and people over the years, and never once have I ever been able to really connect with any of these people, you know, the film industry types. We're shooting a scene where uh, Julie, the sister, TV horror movie. Okay, we gotta go, we gotta shoot this right now. Okay, okay, sorry, let's go. You're in the middle of the road, jackass. Just You're in the middle of the road, jackass. Just like in Close Encounters, remember? Uh, my name is Pernell Richards. I'm just simply playing the role of a guy on the street that's a little bit out there, crazy. He's angry because he, uh, he can't find his way around and uh, he doesn't really know the city too well, so a little high, you know, maybe a little bit drunk. And then you get out of his way and yell turkey when he's by, when he guns it. Turkey! I am protesting the war. And how did you get this gig? Uh, director call, called me and said, I want you. I'm, I'm top, top, top dollar. Worked, uh, worked with, with the Tom, Tom Cruise uh, Friday night. Minority Report. What did, what's your role on that? I was on the subway. <laughs> With Tom? Yes. Uh, wow. He walked uh, right, right past me. Did you slap him on the back of the head just to let him know you were there? No, I don't think so. Vietnam. The hell with Vietnam. The hell with Vietnam. The hell with Vietnam. You're in the middle of the road, jackass! That jackass should be my car stall! You go through all this trouble to make a film. You go through absolute hell, and everything goes wrong. You know, everything uh, just avalanches on top of you. Everything that can go wrong will go wrong. That principle is always in effect when you're making a film. Why are you going through all these headaches? And I don't know. I ask myself that all the time. I, I really do. I, I wonder these things. Why am I bothering? And uh, I don't understand why so many other people want to get into filmmaking. Why? Why? It's nothing but problems. It's nothing but wasted money.
What would you say to filmmakers watching this? What, what can they learn from you? Nothing. They can learn that uh, it's a completely monumental waste of time to be, uh, to be making a film. I have enough money to make one movie, and after that, that's it. I've used my, my life's inheritance on this little personal film, uh, you know, which will uh, most assuredly not bring back anything. Uh, I mean, everybody always says, you know, oh, well, you got to get some money back from all, you know, I've been you know, making films my whole life. I've spent, you know, everything I have on them. They've never really brought anything back. I, I'm not going to expect them to do that now, so. Uh, damn it. Ears. Itching for some reason. It might be these lights. Ooh. I would say to all the filmmakers out there who are getting into film or have been into film for a long time that uh, you are wasting your time beyond anything you could imagine. I mean, it's just, uh, you know, I don't know what to say as far as what you could do as an alternative career, but. If you want to waste your time and money and go through hell, have it absolutely not result in anything, then make a film, because that's exactly what's going to happen. I can tell you that right now.